This was originally going to be broken up into a few short videos and then a larger one, but now it's all collapsed on each other in my head and it's just one big one. What do we mean to do when we talk about a video game? Whether it be a casual conversation about likes and dislikes, awesome moments and stupid decisions, a more formal review on a website or an informal review for a blog, an essay focusing on a single or multiple aspects, or a video essay from a variety of channels and perspectives. Are they to inform, enlighten, advocate for or against, determine its value in the greater culture? Talking about games does all of these things, but the way we go about doing that varies to person to person. It has been eight years since I first started writing reviews online, and I haven't gone a year without putting out something with critical thought, whether a few paragraphs or a video essay. Over that time, my approach to talking about games critically has changed a lot, and I wanted to chart that change to get to where I am now. It would be safe to say that most major gaming websites approach reviews from a consumerist standpoint. That is to say, is this game worth your time, and sometimes factor in money? Though I do think they have made some strides forward from the old ways. Jeff Gerstmann of Giant Bomb has talked at length about the fabled GameSpot review formula, a spreadsheet where the reviewer would punch in numbers for things like graphics, sound, gameplay, reviewer's tilt, etc., and get the final number for the score. IGN had their breakdown box, and many print magazines had the same kind of approach as well, with dividing a game into various pieces, assessing them, and coming out with whatever the final verdict was. Generally, these reviews sought to be exhaustive, definitive, the go-to on deciding what to buy and what to avoid. Now, the quickest way to determine what was and wasn't was by the score, a double-edged sword. Scores are an easy, at-a-glance way of seeing what games are good slash best. Thankfully, sites have begun to drop the scoring system, simply because it devalues the actual text that is talking about the game. A score is universal, but games are not. Despite that, humans love to categorize and box things. We also often fall prey to listicles, the top 500, 100, 50, 25, 10 of the generation, of the decade, of the year, of the platform, etc. Often these lists contradict whatever scoring system is in use, as they don't just pop every game into a spreadsheet, order by score descending, and call it a day. That's because the websites as entities aren't reviewing the games, but individuals within each entity does. Yet, there is a still an unspoken consensus within all these individuals about what games are the best. Looking at Open Critics' 2020 Hall of Fame, 9 out of 12 of the games listed are from publishers with deep pockets. Valve, Nintendo, Sony, Microsoft, and on the lesser end, Koei Tecmo and Annapurna Interactive, both of which either have revenue in the millions or recently settled a $200 million debt case. Currently, Doom Eternal sits at 175 reviews, Final Fantasy VII Remake 154, Ori and the Will of Wisps 130, Animal Crossing 117, Streets of Rage 4 110, Dreams 92, Neo 289, Kentucky Route Zero The Complete Season 44, MLB The Show 44, Lair of the Clockwork God 8, Bug Academy 6. You'd think platform exclusivity would have a larger effect on the total number, and both Final Fantasy VII Remake and Dreams are exclusive to the PlayStation 4, but have more review counts than Kentucky Route Zero, which is on all major platforms. And Doom Eternal at the top makes sense, as it's both multi-platform and a first-person shooter, probably the lowest common denominator when it comes to game appeal. I think the most curious case here is MLB The Show, which suffers from being a sports game, a genre that often ranks in at the top sold every year, but regularly suffers from a lack of enthusiasm from games media. During my time at DualShockers writing up news, sports games definitely were hard to write about consistently, as I just wasn't interested in them, despite there being an audience for them out there. Games that are expected to sell are covered much more than the smaller titles that only get picked up if social media reactions towards them make them a canonical indie game even though the definition of that term has become nearly meaningless in a place where Untitled Goose Game can get picked up by a publisher like Panic Inc., which assures its reach and place within the canon. Indie as independent, as in self-published, is nearly impossible to find at the top of most reviewed list, as the most get swept up by publishers who are needed by developers to help market their game and assure it gets the attention they want. Plenty of people have already talked about that though, from the problem with larger site reviews and the focus on big budget games, and I'm drifting from my intention. The advent of YouTube and marketing of social media brought about some new avenues and platforms to expand the discourse and participants, the video essayists and vloggers and websites dedicated to covering the uncovered. YouTube is probably the most recognized platform, as it dominates the internet as a definitive place to upload whatever video you may have. 
given the copyright robots don't smack it down for whatever infringement they might determine. When it comes to YouTube essayists, I generally sort them into the kind that focus on one aspect of the game in question more than the others. For gameplay, it would be someone like Racevic in Mandalore Gaming. For those I perceive as valuing narrative, I think of Noah Caldwell Gervais, my long-standing favorite, and Aaron Signal. Then there are some that are a mix of both, Joseph Anderson and Matthew Matosis. Super Bunny Hop, I think, has a good variety of coming at games from specific angles, and with interesting ideas on how he covers them. Things like the Death Stranding bike video and talking about Assassin's Creed Odyssey using the Odyssey's writing style. Then there is also Thor High Heels, who focuses more on Japan's output as well as on an eye for aesthetics. The look, the sound, and feel of a game that goes beyond just graphics good. And I haven't come across enough of that on the platform. That isn't to say that this is how they approach their content, it's just how their values come across after spending a significant amount of time watching their content, since most of the videos are more than half an hour. The type of writing I've spent too little time within are the websites that focus on the unfocused. Places like Press.exe, Rebind, The Obscurity, Indie Hell Zone, and the like. These are places that set out to talk about games that you wouldn't find on the front page of IGN and GameSpot, but are still worth talking about. Bullet Points covers many of the larger games, but for much more interesting angles than you would see on something like the feature section of Polygon or Eurogamer. The same could be said for sites like Deep Hell, Uppercut, and Timber Owls. Now, most of this is just to list the things that have influenced the way I approach thinking and writing about a video game. Originally, when I started doing reviews on Tumblr in late 2012, I approached reviews the only way I knew how, the IGN style. Essentially trying to say something about every aspect of the game and give my general feelings. As time progressed and I grew and learned and found new outlets with interesting angles, I also reacted and changed up the way I thought and wrote about video games. From long essays about everything Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare has to say about conflict, to a few short paragraphs about the hacking minigame in System Shock. Nowadays when I approach writing a game, I generally take out a few flashcards and write down questions I want to answer within my writing. Generally I would ask, what is this game trying to accomplish? Does it accomplish that? How well does it accomplish that? To help learn more about criticism, I began to read some literary criticism books last year, as why not look towards one of the oldest mediums of storytelling books in order to get better in general at the various modes of criticism. The first book I read through was James Wood's How Fiction Works, which had a lot of insight into the history of fiction. One of the highlights was his pull quote from Gustave Flaubert. There is a part of everything that remains unexplored. For we have fallen into the habit of remembering, whenever we use our eyes, what people before us have thought of the thing we are looking at. Even the slightest thing contains a little that is unknown. We must find it. To describe a blazing fire or a tree in a plain, we must remain before that fire or that tree until they no longer resemble for us any other tree or any other fire. This quote made me think about how often other people's opinions will influence how we perceive something even before we see, or in this case, play it. Often we react to things in terms of it being overhyped or overrated, and it is something I generally try to keep in mind when talking about games I really like in order to not negatively affect someone's reaction to it. Games like Control and Disco Elysium I really love, but I don't want to send the message to someone that they're all-time greats, because more likely than not, that's going to negatively affect their opinion of it when playing. This is also why when I know I want to write about a game, I try not to read any other reviews or comments or videos online, as I don't want it influencing the way I view that game and its various merits. I want it to be my opinion fully, not something that is colored by other people as well. As I mentioned before, the scoring system for games is dumb, as it assumes all games can be equally weighed on a numbered scale, but this is simply not true. Doom Eternal requires a different kind of approach than Tetris Effect, which requires a different approach than, say, Kentucky Route Zero. These games are all trying to be different things and should be judged differently. When I think of a multiplayer game like Apex Legends, I'm thinking if it's fun to play and balanced, much more so than I am when thinking about a game like Disco Elysium. With that game, I'd be thinking much more about its dialogue, fiction, and characters than I am if the new champion Loba has a set of skills that feel fresh and viable. When I look at my favorite games, specifically games like L.A. Noire, Alien Isolation, and Alan Wake, it seems I like games that buck trends and have ambition. L.A. Noir is the anti-Grand Theft Auto game, with an open world where running over NPCs is nearly impossible, and when you do accomplish it, you're chastised severely for doing so. 
Alien Isolation is the rare video game that looks to adapt the original film instead of its James Cameron sibling Aliens that has inspired so many action titles. Alan Wake is a mishmash of Stephen King, Twin Peaks, and The Twilight Zone, and could only ever exist underneath Rebony Entertainment, a favorite studio of mine for their love of movies and television that manifests in much smarter ways than a one-take presentation or a black-and-white filter gimmick. These are games whose aesthetics I appreciate greatly. The kind of settings where a one-hour ambient noise video seems perfect for working, reading, or just relaxing before bed. Not to say I don't value gameplay, even though it does generally come secondary in what I determined to be some of the best games. Apex Legends is an online shooter I've poured as much time into as my high school days playing Modern Warfare 2. No surprise there, as Respawn formed largely from Infinity Ward. The gunplay, the champion abilities, the speedy progression and ascension of equipment, the human-on-human -human interaction to see who can outwit and outgun the other, it is pure joy of mechanical competition you can only get from online games. There is also Doom 2016, which benefits from not only having a fantastic mechanical sense of purpose, but an aesthetic to go along with it. Less so in its presentation of Mars, Hell, and the various buildings within, but in its approach to the legacy of Doom 1993, and the personality of the player character Doom Guy who punches and crushes everything in his way. This is all well and good as summary statements, but what I really enjoy to read and listen to, what I seek to write out in my own way, are the real nitty-gritty specifics of what makes these games work, how the various pieces of them work together, or sometimes don't, in interesting ways, that make the games worthwhile, even if its Metacritic score may not be at the top of the list. I want to go deep into something like Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare, and talk about how the ability to holster your weapon in Apex Legends made me think about how in Modern Warfare the inability to do that spoke to the importance of guns, and how it's the main way you put your effects out into the world. When I think about Doom Eternal, I want to get into why I find myself drawn to the 2016 Doom, for all the small reasons that maybe nobody else really puts together. When I think about Metroid Prime, I want to try and determine what it is about that insanely playable game, that game that you can just pick up and go, that makes it something you can complete in a marathon rush over a weekend. I want to think about the implication Prey's memory tampering has and whether or not we are more than our collection of half-remembered memories, and if guilt and a need for justice can accompany you even beyond having the memory of your crime erased. I want to compare how Fallout New Vegas handles violence as something that has consequences, in comparison to its predecessor Fallout 3, in which violence was openly asked for and joyfully executed for your pleasure. I also want to think about characters and how we determine what makes a bad character. During my replay through of Persona 4 Golden, I often thought about Yosuke, your first friend you make in Inaba, and something who is a source of a majority of the game's no homo dialogue. It seems impossible for Yosuke to exist in a scene with Kanji, who the game teases with the notion of being gay before revealing it's just that he likes traditionally feminine things like sewing and craft making, without teasing Kanji about how he maybe likes guys. Yosuke is the first to freak out when put into a position that could be considered homosexual, and compensates for it by competing with Teddy over the girl's attention and seeing them naked or near it. Yosuke seems to be a great case of a type of character that can be dismissed as damning for the game itself, which he is when combined with Kanji and Naoto's storylines, even if he is definitely a person that does exist in our reality. He has what James Woods describes as thisness, a substance to him that makes him a real person, and just because he is morally disagreeable doesn't make him someone that shouldn't be included. In other words, artists should not ask us to try and understand characters we cannot approve of, or not until after they have firmly and unequivocally condemned them. The idea that we might be able to feel that ick factor, and simultaneously see life through the eyes of these two aging and lecherous men, and that this moving out of ourselves into realms beyond our daily experience might be a moral and sympathetic education of its own kind, seems beyond this particular commentator of whom all one can say is that she is unlikely to be so unforgiving when she herself has reached 70. But there is nothing egregious about this article. A glance at the thousands of foolish reader reviews on Amazon.com with their complaints about dislikable characters confirms the contagion of moralizing niceness. This sort of condemnation nearly happened with Disco Elysium, which includes the ability to play as a fascist character with fascist thoughts, racist beliefs, and dialogue choices to back those up. 
My fear was that people would play it, see those things, and write off the game as a fascist sympathizer, which is not. Thankfully, Steven Scaife at Finebite did the kind of playthrough and found the game to do as James Woods describes, condemned that kind of character. As Scaife wrote, being what your character terms an absolutely giant fascist often means an absence of empathy, sometimes literally when it comes to the empathy skill. A disinterest in what's going on with people in favor of saying horrible things to them, or perhaps arresting them outright. In doing so, you close off certain quest lines and segments as a consequence of your lack of curiosity. It's the dialogue equivalent of playing through a big Bethesda-esque RPG and just trying to kill everyone you meet. The best test for this early on is when you come across Measurehead in order to access the way to speak to the union leader. You can choose to listen to his explanations about his racist ideology and eugenics, the superiority of people of a certain birth over others, and even internalize them in a way of getting him to let you pass. The mere option of this existing is enough for some people to turn up their nose and walk away, choosing to take nothing away from the experience instead of seeing what it is the game is trying to say through these actions. With a game like Bioshock Infinite, even there is something to be gained by understanding what it is trying to say, even if it is a way to uncover the beliefs behind Ken Levine and his creative team in regards to a justified revolution, which translates into beliefs held by a good portion of the public and gives you the information which to try and turn them towards a better path. This doesn't mean you have to regard Infinite as a good game, but there is something to be gained from playing as a character you wouldn't associate with in real life, just as there is something to be gained from reading about their life and story. The second book I've been reading, Literary Theory, an introduction by Terry Eagleton, has also been insightful more so in terms of the history of literary criticism and the lessons that we can learn from that. Near the beginning there is the statement, all literary works are rewritten, if only subconsciously, by the societies that read them. This applies to video game criticism in the same game I mentioned just before, Bioshock Infinite. A game that received praise within the mainstream critic circles, but as time has gone on, the consensus has been more and more negative towards it as non-mainstream voices became bigger and more listened to. Lastly, and importantly, is the quote, Any such notion of absolute objectivity is an illusion. It is to my great dismay that, even now, there are still those who cling to this belief that there is some objectivity to be had when talking about the value of a piece of media, as if there is something 100% of people in the world can agree on as fact when it comes to liking or disliking a game, a movie, or a TV show. Even more so than journalism, where objectivity has been misinterpreted and misapplied as neutrality, reviews are entirely up to the personal biases a person has towards certain aspects of a piece of fiction. This is why, as I said earlier, the entities of IGN and GameSpot do not review a game. An individual within them does, and that individual differs from the others within, which is why their internal lists and reviews can often contradict others, because they're all humans with different dislikes and likes. A review is inherently an opinion, and while we can give each other shit freely for the things we choose to like and dislike, the idea that we can rail against something objectively should have been thrown out the window a decades ago. If you want an objective review, find the Wikipedia that lists out all the back-of-the-box facts about how many weapons there are, if there is music, and what characters' names are. As soon as you transition into having an opinion about those things, you are no longer objectively describing the game. This line of thinking is about as tired as the games with no politics shtick, and I can't believe we're still seeing it appear in many places online. But at least it's an easy way to write off people who aren't worth the time of day. It's interesting to look back and see where I came from as far as thinking critically uh, or even just the casual conversations I sort of have with friends about video games. It's also been such a long-standing thing that I don't think it'll ever be something I don't engage with. Sure, there'll be times where I don't write anything for months and months on end as this YouTube channel uh, can show you, but I also think that thinking about video games and writing about it is something that I'll probably be doing for the rest of my life as far as I can tell. And just like I look at myself every year previous and think about how much I've grown and learned since that time, I think that'll also continue to happen as well as far as critically thinking about video games does. Every year I'll look back at the opinion pieces that I put out and go, wow, I can't believe I said that. Just like I do now when I look back at all my old Tumblr reviews. And I think that's a good thing. Thank you for listening to me ramble about my many thoughts on how criticism is done within the gaming community, for mainstream writers at the top, to those like me who are just doing it because it's something I enjoy. I hope I can carve out my own space like the channels I have listed previously, with a voice that viewers can get a sense of what I prioritize and like. 
as it's best when you know a person well enough to know when you're going to sync up on things and don't, but can still find value in listening to them talk about the things you don't. As always, you can find me on Twitter at number 8 Axel and Illustrious Magic at Illustrious Magi, and subscribe for more videos that cover whatever it is that's been on my mind.